Do we have folks on the internet? All right, hello internet folks. It's weird talking into a microphone where I, where I can't hear myself <laughs> beyond the microphone. <laughs> All right, yeah, we can, uh, we can go ahead and get started. Welcome to Keystone Merge 2022. I don't know about any of you folks, but I uh, started doing Keystone Merge stuff about 2018. When did you guys start? 2018? And then COVID kind of came through, but now we're back. Um, it's exciting to be a part of something where there's so many cool people traveling around uh, multiple counties, multiple towns, cities, uh, and Dillsburg especially, we welcome you. I know some people, this is their first time here, so round of applause to all of those who've <laughs> coming to Dillsburg for the time, yes. So uh, we did a business walk earlier this afternoon. That was really fun. I got really hot and sweaty walking up and down the street, uh, visiting some of the businesses and, and talking to the business owners. Um, so yeah, so uh, thank you for your County Economic Alliance for setting that up. And um, everybody that at uh, Bloom, shout out to Bloom, shout out to Downtown Inc. Downtown Inc, that's what we call it, right? Thanks, sorry. So many, th so many people here. Um, yeah, so this is Catapult Engineering. I can uh, give you a whole spiel later. I'll, I can give some t uh, tours and stuff after the presentations, and we can just kind of chit-chat after our entrepreneurs give their presentations. Um, just wanted to shout out to all of the people who make this happen. Sorry for the internet people shuffling my paper. So many partners. They're all on the back here. Uh, and Culture, Catamaran, Braided River Collective, the Grotto Community Center. White Rose Ventures, and York County Economic Alliance, as well as all of our community partners. So thanks for uh, supporting this uh, organization and these events. Um, tonight you'll hear from two entrepreneurs. Uh, we have Kendra Wolf and Mark Murata, did I say that right? And Ben White. Uh, so first up will be Kendra Wolf, uh, talking to you guys about unique Lancaster experiences. And then uh, Mark and Ben's company, Amparo. Amparo? Amparo? Amparo. Cool. Um, let's see. Anything else? Did I miss something? Yeah? Awesome. I totally prepared for this. Like, I do everything in life. I don't completely live my life uh, every minute. Um, just by the seat of my... Yeah. Yep. Uh, very, uh, very sporadic. So, uh, we got everything working. The tech guys got us. A round of applause to the tech guys. Thank you guys, they got here a while ago to getting everything ready and working for everyone at home and, and for you guys. So um, I think without, I think that's it. We can have our first presenter. Come on up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this is weird. All right. <laughs> Hi, welcome, and thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to be introducing to you a company that I created called Unique Lancaster Experiences. I created this company to kind of be the bridge between uh, locals and tourists, um, and also as a resource for entrepreneurs to be able to take whatever gifts and talents that they have and turn it into profitable experiences to share with other people. So um, during my time with you, um, my goal is to kind of tell you a little bit more about how I got here and how this business was started. Uh, I'm sure many of you at some point have probably Googled uh, things to do in Lancaster or stuff to do when your family comes in town and found either nothing or something that you weren't interested in um, or were offered an Amish buggy ride. Um, so the goal of my company is to diversify tourism in a way in central PA, specifically Lancaster, that offers um, something different, something unique, and something that's specific to uh, entrepreneurs in a way that will um, be able to expand on their specific gifts. Sorry, I was not anticipating that. Um, and then question and answer. So if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, but ultimately, at the end, we want to just be able to answer the question, how do we diversify tourism um, in central PA? So I came to Lancaster um, after traveling as a nomad for about five years and um, settled down in Lancaster downtown um, conveniently enough, one month before the pandemic started. Um, so from my East Orange Street apartment, I just glared out the window thinking about all the things I'd like to do and all the people that I would like to meet <laughs> and spent a lot of time researching all that was going on in Lancaster, although I could not go out and experience it. So as soon as I could, 
I was very excited to go out and learn about all the different possibilities that there was. And I learned very quickly that there was a lot of potential to bring really interesting opportunities to Lancaster. Um, so the most popular experience is the International Food Tour, which is a walking food tour of Lancaster downtown, which allows people to taste foods from a variety of different countries, including Burkina Faso in West Africa and um, Frikadella open face sandwiches from Denmark, as well as getting to uh, hear culturally diverse stories from different chefs and business owners, all, all of which are specifically uh, minorities, immigrants, refugees, or women. Um, while also getting to experience some of the history of the Green Book, as well as hearing the contributions to the Underground Railroad. Another one of our experiences is the historic walking photo shoot, which has brought people from uh, anywhere from Puerto Rico to right outside of Lidditz into downtown Lancaster to visit the historical sites of um, minority-owned businesses um, dating back 200 years, while also getting um, their photos taken and captured um, by a crew of professional photographers, including myself, um, which is hopefully what we hope to be um, images and memories that will last for generations. So in addition to the daily tours that we do um, every single week, we also do community focused events um, such as the Galentine's Day scavenger hunt and seasonal limousine tours. Um, so generally speaking, the idea is just to find a blind spot somewhere in the city and then to offer that business owner the opportunity to create something exciting and interesting that people will want to do with whatever their specific platform is. Um, so really it is very community focused in the event that we want to bring people from outside of Lancaster and out side of central PA into Lancaster to be able to experience everything that it has to offer. Um, so within the last 11 months, we have created uh, 15 local business partnerships. We currently run about four different tours and there are three of us, including me. And um, hopefully by the end of 2022, the goal is to have six different experiences running all throughout the year. Um, so the big question is, again, how do we diversify tourism and local experiences in Lancaster? I think that that answer is to simply um, diversify the melting pot, allow at-risk youth in need of guidance um, to join and explore their potential, allow local entrepreneurs with special gifts and talents to take something that they just enjoy, enjoy doing for fun and turn it into a profitable business, and then, of course, allowing uh, reformed individuals who are re-entering society um, trying to get out of recidivism to join our team and use whatever t talents and gifts that they have. And of course, just anybody who is from any demographic or any background to take whatever they find interesting, take whatever they find to be fun, which is literally all this is, is a co collaboration of things I find interesting and fun that I turned into a business. Um, so th to expand that, um, that's the goal. So uh, you can feel free to connect through my website, through uh, Instagram, and also on Facebook. What success have you had with the at-risk youth in, in downtown Lancaster? So right now I would say that we're making really valuable partnerships that are going to allow us to get to that point in this expansion period. It really is just right now planting that seed. We've done probably 300 tours in the last you know 11 months, which of course is heavily impacted by COVID. Um, so as people start to get more comfortable going out and that seed gets planted, then we officially have um, a, a seed that's planted really well for the at-risk youth who don't want them coming into something that's wavery. So. So follow up to that, have you uh, made those partnerships with Assets, uh, Water Street Mission, those type of organizations? Yeah, I do partner with Water Street Mission because I am an employee there. So I am the volunteer coordinator at Water Street Mission. So that's a part of my connection with them. Thanks for the presentation. Thanks. Just a quick question about your business. Sure. Um, I'm guessing your tours are kind of a the, the key source of revenue for your business. You know, what's what's ahead? What challenges are ahead that you're thinking about? Like, how do you grow your business? Mm -hmm. um, what are some things that you kind of need to figure out in order to take the next step in growth? 
Yeah, so like I said, right now we run about three to four different uh, tours and experience every single week. And so to expand it, we just need more people with different interests. So we have someone, people who are interested in doing like a paint in the park. We have some people who want to do you know, macrame parties um, and all of those things. The you know trends are showing that people want more authentic and more intentional ways of experiencing their vacations and more authentic ways of experiencing their free time. Um, so all of those different things are what lead us into expansion, just more people with different interests being able to to share what they want to do with, you know, the community. Uh, it's a really cool concept that you have. Out of curiosity, how are you connecting with people? Are you using, like, Airbnb uh, mm -hmm. experiences? Like, do you guys mm -hmm. have your tours listed on Airbnb experiences for people that are coming in and out of town traveling mm -hmm. for business or personal? Um, like, what is your usual way of booking one of your experiences? Yeah, Airbnb experience is actually how it all started. Um, my three experiences are three of the seven only experiences on Airbnb. Um, in addition to TripAdvisor and Yelp and um, other platforms as well as my website for booking and also Eventbrite. So um, different channels, WGAL, Fox 43, they all find out about these events, um, the quarterly you know, events and the daily tours all through those platforms. <laughs> Us do tours. Only if you take down the tolls. <laughs> <laughs> what tolls? The ones I took to get here. <laughs> oh. I went the Google Maps route. <laughs> I went through two just getting here. Yeah, yeah. York's the other yeah. direction. Yeah. Okay. I mean, sorry, York, like, downtown. So yep. I moved here originally. I was living as a nomad before coming here, so I have no clue where I am right now. Google Maps <laughs> gets me everywhere I am. I have no clue where I am. <laughs> Yeah. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> and I liked it. Yeah. Awesome. What kind of unexpected hurdles have you come across and um, how did you solve them? Honestly, I would love to say I've had a lot of hurdles, but I really haven't. <laughs> I've, they, I think part of my story is like sharing how Lancaster and Central PA is so open to entrepreneurs and so open to minorities who want to start businesses. And that's a lot of the, the key factor in what I do. And so if anything, I've just had a lot of people want to partner with me and I'm just one person. So being in school full time and being a single parent and running this business on the side is probably the biggest hurdle. It's just, you know, I'm only one human being. Um, so in order to expand, you know, we just have to, to broaden and find more people who want to do cool stuff. So I'm a little late to the game. So my name is Brittany Brooks. Um, I'm actually the director of community engagement for Downtown Inc. So um, <laughs> for Downtown York. So I mean, we would love to get with you and your team and just collaborate, um, just kind of exchange some ideas, just kind of see yeah. where you're at. Maybe you can uh, lend some of your strategies to us and we can lend mm -hmm. some of your, our strategies to you and yeah. you know create a meaningful partnership. So before I leave, because I'm going to leave here in a little bit, about 15 minutes, I would like to slide you my card. Okay. And Okay. please reach out. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Kendra. And uh, Rocky, you didn't have any financial advice for her? nothing? You good? Yeah. She's solid? All right. Maybe, okay. Down, down the way we can go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, why don't you guys start coming up and uh, getting ready, and then we can. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could use the. Yeah, sure. Oh, nice. Awesome. Yeah, I can do that. Um, so real quick, I'll, I'll do a little plug for Catapult. 
Um, so you might notice we have uh, a few 3D printers up here. Uh, one is actively printing. We just started one up for the for the camera. Um, historically, we have had a uh, a makerspace in here. We started this in 2016 as a way to kind of educate the local community, but also uh, work with students uh, to get in here as interns um, and to work for our main uh, business, which is engineering utility poles, which is uh, kind of boring. Um, but the software we build for it is really fun. And uh, so we try and get kids uh, excited about code, and they learn how to do code and CAD and all kinds of stuff through their 3D printing experiences and laser cutting and CNC machining and soldering and making electronics, all the stuff you see on these shelves over here. Uh, interns made, kids made, um, and put together. So th those are all our Makebox projects. We used to have a Makebox product, which was a, a monthly subscription. Um, and uh, after a few years, we turned it into an Internet of Things Makebox. So everyone actually had a Wemos chip, and they'd connect it to their Wi-Fi. And we started uh, seeing that people weren't actually putting their box together. So we got really sad um, and stopped doing Makebox. But we still have a really great internship program. Um, and we bring in a half a dozen interns every semester and in the summer. And that's, this is where they work. So that's basically the, the very short TLDR of what the space is for. Uh, we also have a bunch of people that actually work out of the space as their main office. So uh, you guys ready? All right. Mark and Ben, take it away. So good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Murata. This is Ben White, my business partner, and we're here to tell you about Amparo, our business. Uh, first, we want to thank Keystone and Cannibalt. Uh, we feel like as two young guys with a young business, this is a cool experience, for lack of a better term, uh, but we're very excited to be here. So who we help, who we work with, uh, work in the arts industry. First, we're working with uh, emerging artists. Uh, we feel like they're in a tough position because they're either trying to get that gallery representation, that brick and mortar feel, which is notorious for undermining young artists or just emerging artists. Um, so we feel like they're stuck in a rock and a hard place. They have the physical aspect, but then they also, they could do their own thing, develop a website, but that's a behemoth of a project for undertaking. Um, so we're trying to, yeah, I'm sorry. So we're trying to offer some tech support for them as well. Next, we're working with established artists. Uh, a little bit more old school. They've made their in-person brick and mortar business. Um, but with the developing digital marketplace e-commerce platform with art basically going online, um, they're a little bit stuck in their ways, uh, trying to push the brick and mortar galleries uh, relationship, maybe a little bit, stretch a little bit too thin at this point. And then next we work with art patrons. Uh, we've identified three specific types of art patrons, people who are new to art investing and art collecting, um, which they're looking for to the to, to, define a taste, basically. Um, they want to buy art. They have the money to buy art, but they don't know where to start. They can't really go to the galleries because it's intimidating. And they can't really look on the internet because you can get lost in catalogs of websites of just more arts and prints. And then we have medium, what we're calling like middle porridge type collectors. They, they have their taste. They have some artwork. Now we're looking to, they're looking to refine their collection and their taste and what they have, and looking to expand um, off current collections. And then we have the established collectors who, for us, it's more headhunting. They know what they have. They have their collections. Um, they have very strong in portfolios, investment pieces. So now we're almost headhunting, trying to find artwork that works for them. So what Amparo does is it's a marketplace for fine art that makes virtual modeling technology more accessible for artists and buyers. We're really trying to marry the fine art sector, home decor with seamless e-commerce system that customers are used to and trustworthy that they can buy investment pieces level of art. So if you were to visit our website listed here on our art, this is live, so if you were to pull this up, you'll get immediately brought to our gallery page. This is where all the artwork's listed. You can kind of click and drag. It's a little, um, it's as immersive as one of the gallery feel. Um, it'll show you all the work, give you the basic information. If you like a piece, you click on it. No, I'm sorry. Then it'll bring you to our virtual staging. Uh, right now, it's 2D virtual staging with both a residential and commercial uh, sector. So you could, if you had a boardroom, a dentist's office, or if you wanted to match artwork for 
a home office, bedroom, your kitchen per se. Um, we have different types of options that you could essentially vir virtually stage your work. And then color theory, which speaking with artists, we noticed that the coloring behind artwork is very important for the presentation of the work. Um, but there's the art aspect, and then we also want to make sure the consumer, the patrons, I'm sorry, this wasn't close. Um, not everyone's house looks like a gallery. It doesn't look like it. not everyone's going to have blank white walls. You need artwork that's going to match and going to fit your space. So you have, we have a hex code that you can put in your exact color combination so we can match the wall perfectly. So I'm going to talk a little bit about who our artists are currently. Uh, we are, our vision is to cover the Northeast region with our home base being Lancaster, Pennsylvania. That's where our first three artists uh, came on board. We have since found uh, a wonderful artist out in Philadelphia, and then uh, we've found uh, potentially really good expansion opportunities up in Boston uh, that would get us into that New England market. So we have uh, two other fabulous artists who are up in Boston uh, that we're happy to represent. And so between these six artists, they uh, have supplied about 50 paintings worth of inventory that we were able to put up on our website. And uh, on our website that we launched April 13th, we have uh, about 278 new users uh, as of today, and we have made two sales on our paintings. Uh, the way that we're reaching the three audiences that uh, Mark has outlined earlier uh, is through online advertising. So we're on Instagram, we're on LinkedIn. Uh, we're also running Google ad campaigns to really try to specify and get into those areas that we think uh, you know, people are able to, to buy art. We're also working hard with uh, partnerships and sponsorships. So on sponsorship side, we're working with the DeMuth Foundation in Lancaster. Uh, we're sponsoring their events uh, throughout this year to really tap into the artist community and show strong support uh, in the Lancaster community. And on the partnership side, we are partnering with Artsy. They are an online uh, catalog for specifically for galleries to help uh, their galleries reach clientele that they're collecting. Uh, and they are, they're well known in the arts world. They are trusted. And what we found through talking with artists and also talking with customers is that Oftentimes when you're buying art, you want to kind of cross-reference and learn as much about the artist and the piece that you're buying as possible. Being up on Artsy allows us to uh, give even us as a young company that uh, trustworthiness, the build a little bit of validation within the marketplace. Um, so this is what our, our gallery and, and uh, our art listing looks like up on uh, Artsy's website. Uh, and with that, thank you for listening. So we'll take any questions that you all have. Or uh, one of our next steps that we're looking to do is, uh, you know, we, we feel that we have a strong foundation. We've uh, put the time in. And uh, as young entrepreneurs, we're, we're wondering what's that next step. And uh, if there are any recommendations on uh, how to start fundraising, how to, you know, initiate those conversations, uh, step into the room, and really put our business and our best foot forward to those opportunities, uh, we would love to hear any experience, any uh, recommendations. What are you looking for in artists? What type of, just simply paintings? Are you looking for sculptures? And what criteria you're looking for in the artist? If it's a, say an up and coming artist, unknown artist, are you looking for that type of work as well? As far as the type of artist, I would say we're working with both emerging and established. So if the name's out there or not, we don't really have a preference. Um, we, we feel like we represent both smaller Lancaster-based artists, and then we have some, we have a few home run hitters who have been in the MoMA and the Met. So um, as far as the artists, they, we can represent any type. As far as the type of art they produce, right now we're only able to work with 2D original paintings. Uh, that's limited to our virtual staging capabilities. Um, but we are looking to expand into 3D modeling, which will allow us to sculpturing, uh, even furniture, or uh, other home products. Go
great presentation, and uh, congrats on launching the website uh, recently. It looks really good. Um, my question would be, what are you doing to find new artists uh, on your platform? You know, like how are you reaching out? You, you talked about how you reach out to customers, but how are you reaching out to artists to get more artists onto the platform? I would say it's a pretty organic outreach. Uh, it's a lot of going to these artist guilds, going to not already represented galleries, um, but we found a few locations where there's a large space of studios, uh, just speaking with artists there. Uh, we've also had some recommendations of artists uh, as well. Uh, so an artist may rec recommend another artist, uh, like an artist friend, um, which has helped even if it hasn't been an artist on our portfolio or in our uh, stable, just having that conversation um, and learning what their needs are. Yeah, and uh, just to add on to that, uh, we really want to focus on uh, the relationships that we build with artists. There are a lot of uh, art catalogs out there and large scale websites that, you know, artists are one of thousands of paintings that are listed online. So, uh, you know, ultimately we're looking for uh, a, a mid-size representation of artists so that they each feel that they have some, some connection to us as uh, the people working in the business, that they have full control on their art even though uh, we're out there and, and pushing, pushing their work. So. Uh, a follow-up question to that specifically then. Um, have you thought about like giving the artist a specific space on your website to like curate their own room or give a biography or anything like that? Um, yeah, we certainly have thought about that. Uh, and that would be in, in future iterations of our website. Uh, but for right now, uh, with the, the vision of moving into this uh, virtually staged environment, that's what we want to focus on first. Uh, and then open it up from there. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. You talked a little bit about some of your customers, your patrons being commercial businesses. Is that right? What's the scale of that? Like, is it a privately owned doctor's office, or are you talking like corporate buildings or hospitals, things like that? Like, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so I mean, really uh, any sort of corporate clientele. Uh, in fact, there's some interesting research out there about how uh, art in the workplace is uh, really beneficial for its employees. And, uh, you know, it, not only just having like one piece of art that's up there for like the entire, you know, lease of the office space, but mm -hmm. really rotating uh, that artwork around and featuring other others. Uh, so our regional approach to having artists in different areas uh, can certainly uh, be attractive to those businesses that also want to find ways to support the artist community by hanging their work up in their space. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's super important because a lot of, um, you know, artists can have, sometimes, I think a lot of times the reason that commercial businesses and larger scale places like that don't seek out a local artist or someone close by because it's more challenging, right? It's harder, it's more work for them to do that than a hospital say, I'm just going to use this catalog and pick a bunch of ugly prints that look like they're from Home Goods, right? And we, <laughs> I personally, I'm very invested in getting away from that, right? So um, I love this as a potential platform for that. I'm just going to pitch it very selfishly. That, that could be a really helpful thing if you can ease that process for those larger clients to find local work or, or not even local, but um, original, you know. So I appreciate what you're doing. A question, and then perhaps a consideration slash question on fundraising after that. The first question is very direct. What the hell does Amparo mean? <laughs> yeah, you want to take this one? I can take this yeah, yeah. Um, so we have a threefold answer. Uh, first, it is quite literally the blue. Uh, that's our company color. Uh, secondly, the translation is to pr for protection. We figured as young people, whenever we told people we want to start an art company, it was always geared towards like, is it NFTs or anything? But we feel like investing in physical art and original paintings, uh, kind of like a dying, dying breed of sorts. So we figured like the protection of investing in these fine art artists. And then lastly, it's a, like an old family name. Uh, so we figured it tied in nicely. With the, uh, you ought to tell that story in your pitch because it's a great story. But by the way, your overall story is really nice. Um, the fundraising. Have you considered bringing on a third partner, and that third partner could perhaps be one of your uh, seasoned 
uh, artists who maybe have some capital and sees the value of what you're doing? I wouldn't say we brought on uh, thinking about an artist, uh, but we are looking to expand our operations and our team as well. Because um, right now it's just us two, um, but there's a lot to learn in the art market. Same with websites. Um, so we feel like both, either whether it's the, the tech side or the product and the art side, um, anyone in those sectors would be interested. Are you currently taking a commission from the sales on your site? Yes. And uh, what we, structure does that look like for the artists? It's, it's just 30% of the price list of the artwork. And then we also work with a professional shipper who comes, packages, crates, insures, delivers, and even installs the artwork. Uh, they have that option. I definitely wasn't going to ask you about NFTs. Uh, <clears throat> so um, have you thought about doing any kind of like subscription model with your commercial clients that you can like rotate uh, the artwork, or is that already built in? I, we are uh, very much thinking about the subscription base. Um, we think it would be nice. Our main concern right now is the shipping and the insurance um, and protecting the artwork for the artists because that if there is a damage to the artwork for us, it's just one of 50, but for the artists, it's one of six. Uh, so we want to make sure that we can ensure if an artwork's going to be in a restaurant that seems like a high traffic, uh, high traffic area that anything could happen, uh, where if it's in a hospital, a larger piece, it's a, waiter rooms are a little bit more of a quiet environment, uh, a little bit more temperate. So um, I'll say manage, once we can figure out the logistics of moving the artworks from location to location and protecting the, ensuring the piece, um, I'll say until then. Thank you. Uh, Mark and Ben, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I, I know it's a huge first step to even get in front of a crowd like this when you're starting a business, so uh, thank you for that. Um, Chelsea and Isaac both stole my questions <laughs> around your business model and your <laughs> revenue model, so I'll, uh, actually I'll answer that question first. Uh, ben Franklin, I think, is a, is a no-brainer uh, for where you guys are at right now. They can give you a ton of help um, and get you to the point where you can elevate the company where you know, other investors can come, you know, possibly take a look. So definitely recommend that. I guess, so a spinoff of the business model question is um, more qualitative. You know, is there anything unique about the art space that you have noticed since starting the business that kind of informed or influenced your business model and how you, uh, how you, structured, how you structured it? I would say, actually with the question we just answered, at least for me, uh, the initial, because this actually started off as a business project uh, just in school in college. So our iterations there were like a business, uh, basically a rental of an art service. Uh, and then we realized for the artists, there's no protection on that. Uh, we weren't necessarily sure how much of a commission they could collect uh, from the artists. They weren't, they didn't like the idea of the, I guess they're, they're having their own separation anxiety of an artwork just being gone for three months. Um, and they're only going to receive a piece of what the final price list was. Um, so learning that, then we realized that the artists, we were representing artists, we were working with artists. Uh, more so than being it just a, a face that's bridging the two together. Yeah, add on to yeah. Uh, just quickly to, to add on to that as well. Uh, we, this was also, I mean, timed with the pandemic as well, uh, with artists a lot of times selling just straight out of their studios uh, when you can't have your studios open and you can't have people uh, coming in and, and looking at your works, so then you have to adapt to online. And uh, there are a lot of, you know, quick solutions to put up a, a website, but uh, ultimately, if there's bad web development, then it's ta detracting from the look and feel of the art itself, which should be front and center. So that's what we've taken into consideration with, uh, with our website, as well as where we want to take it with uh, the virtual modeling. Uh, one of the questions I had, or actually have two, uh, the first one is, uh, have you considered doing uh, any kind of live painting events or something like that to raise funds, bring in an artist, do a broadcast live stream sort of a thing and do a live, we've done a couple live paintings at our freelance York co-working space and while they didn't have a really huge turnout, it gave the artist the opportunity to not just do what they usually do in private, but also do it in a way where people are seeing, they're able to send a heart or a like or a whatever, you know, or even some encouragement kind of a thing. Sometimes having live events could be a solution now that COVID is relaxing a little bit and people are mingling out in the world again uh, was one thing. And uh, what, what were your thoughts on that? You know, has that, has that been something, something that you guys considered or um, do you have a space or is your only space online? Like, do you guys have a space uh, where you, you know, 
hold the art or, or whatever, that type of thing. Yeah, so uh, currently we are online. Uh, the reason why we partnered with the shipper is uh, to keep any sort of like inventory or costs uh, associated with that low. Uh, okay. So all the, artists stay, all the art stays with the artist. Uh, and then when uh, a sale comes through our platform, then they work with our shipper and they you. can send it out. Um, that being said, mm -hmm. having a live painting event would uh, be a great idea. And you know, we could certainly, uh, because of the relationship that we're bu building with our artists, where mm -hmm. you know they're they're more than just you know a, a transactional relationship. We're you know getting to know them. Right. Oftentimes, can just shoot them a text. Uh, we can use their use their space and use their studio as kind of a. a co-partnership uh, in terms of helping us, you know, grow and, and get our name out there as well as getting uh, foot traffic in their artist studios. Gotcha. And then the other extension of another question is uh, AR. Have you guys considered using augmented reality at all for allowing people to see a particular painting in their own space, you know, in the bathroom or in the foyer or whatever? You know, has that been something that uh, you guys plan on incorporating into your website's platform to give people the opportunity to visualize more than just with color palette, complementary colors, et cetera, sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, it was just an idea I was thinking about. Yeah, we definitely have. Um, do you want to touch more on, on that? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, as far as I would say that this is the uh, AR and development, we definitely position ourselves towards our, our patrons, what we're calling, um, as art consultants. Uh, so if they do send us an image, we could Photoshop at least right now with the 2D staging, we could Photoshop and provide services as far as we can with the flat images, uh, but we are looking to be uh, able to, like you could send us a wall and then we could, you could put anything there and we'll show you exactly what it looks like exactly. Yeah, the, the conversation's kind of headed in the direction of my next question. And what I wanted to ask was if you had considered having a, someone who's maybe an interior designer consult before a piece would be purchased because a lot of times you know people might be hesitant to buy a, a certain art piece because you know they're wondering will it look good and I know you guys are taking some steps to address that but having that second opinion of a you know a, a professional might you know be enough we to agree. you know turn a convert it into a sale we agree uh, we've also had to like address our company as ourselves as whether we're doing home decor or the fine art and it's an investment piece. Uh, we are interested in bringing on a interior designer, someone with more of a visual eye, just because it helps us with all branding and marketing. Um, so right now it's just us uh, working that on colors we think look nice and whatever we think design is, but two young guys may think differently of what's nice than um, someone who's middle-aged uh, and who already has a house, essentially. And my next question is, as you do grow the amount of artworks that you represent and the amount of artists that you represent, how is it that you're going to enable someone to search for a specific piece of art? Because they're all original pieces, and I don't know that it would be easy to describe them or tag them in certain ways. And rather than having you know a large, you know, basically almost looking like a photo album on the site, uh, what what have you considered about uh, addressing the issue when your collection grows? I would say that's why we're drawing, we would like to have a cap on artists. Um, like Ben mentioned before, we don't necessarily want to be a catalog website. Uh, if you're an artist, you don't want to be buried amongst a hundred. Uh, you want to be with 20 or so reputable other names. Um, so we, we do want to draw a, have a cap of some sorts. So it's more of a curated collection? Yes. Have you thought about doing regional caps based on some of the comments earlier and, and sourcing local artwork? That makes sense. Local is a relative term to everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, we're all in New York County. I mean, we're sitting in New York County, but some people, I live here in Dillsburg, and a lot of times Dillsburg doesn't often get thought of as York County. So I know how, you know, and, and I, I do trade shows and events all over the country. So, like, three days from now, I go to Austin. So I don't think anything of local. To me, it's all over because it's all accessible. But depending on someone's definition, they may want to be able to search in a certain region, especially if, you know, some of the things that Rita, you were mentioning about potential corporate avenues to connect with the, the folks that, that are beyond just the home user and that could adopt maybe a whole line of a certain artist or a certain region. Um, that might be a way. Otherwise, you might find you limit 
your capacity to bring this to more people that find it of value. Because it doesn't take long to, to uh, fill up two dozen spots or 30 spots. Or, so I'm curious what you're thinking there. I agree with the regional cap. Um, yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think as, because we definitely want to be northeast uh, at first. Uh, we're, we're targeting basically Lancaster, what we're calling Lancaster, and then eastwards uh, up to Boston and then hitting that New England region. Um, but I do like the idea of certain, like, X number in this city, that city, and then caring. I think it would uh, help us keep, like, bite-sized, tangible, uh, measurable goals. And one thing uh, not, not pictured here on our slide deck, but if you go uh, on our website, you can uh, search. We have a, a number of search filters. Uh, so on, uh, on the artist, if you want to look for, you know, something location-based, that's there is that filter there uh, on our on our shop all page. You can also filter by artist or uh, color and even like theme landscape uh, as well as size. Uh, you know, big if you're trying to fill like a whole wall or you just have a little bit of space. Just uh, thanks for the for the pitches a whole. I thought. As you were asking questions about suggestions just for fundraising, there's just two things that came to mind as I was listening through. I think um, a little similar to a Martin's comment, just uh, zeroing in a little bit more on why you're in the game. Like, why does this matter to you? I think that would be because it came out over our Q and A time. But I was wondering that, like, um, as we got to Q and A, like, why are you kind of personally invested? And then the second idea might be to, um, particularly because not everybody knows this market. Um, what's the market opportunity? You know, what's the opportunity for making money in this space? Um, and we got to your revenue model a little bit after Q and A, but I think that those two things are key for investors as they're thinking about, you know, will we fund this idea? Yeah, that was great feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Mark and Ben. Another round of applause for Mark and Ben and Kendra Wolf both. Thank you for presenting. Um, again, uh, big thanks to our community partners. Uh, if any of you know any other entrepreneurs that are uh, you know, coming up with, with new businesses and new ideas, um, please send them, probably not my way, but maybe Alexa, uh, and, and to Keystone Merge. Yeah, sorry, KeystoneMerge.com. Yes, thank you. Uh, next month's merge is in Harrisburg at WITF's Public Media Center, hosted by our friends at Ben Franklin and Harrisburg Lun Launchbox. Um, I think that's pretty much it for uh, Keystone Merge tonight. Uh, feel free to stick around, grab some more food. I'll be kind of mingling around. I can talk to you guys about Catapult more and uh, what we do here and some of the equipment that we have in the space and anything you would ever want to know about Dillsburg, if you're curious. So, <laughs> Thank you for coming. Have a great night.